This is Topic 8, Macroeconomic Fundamentals Part 2. So, so far in this course, uh, in terms of the macroeconomics part of the course, we've been doing a lot of work on things such as gross domestic product, inflation, deflation, uh, business cycles, the causes of business cycles, a little bit on economic growth. Uh, we've looked at, um, most recently, the aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. So this topic is about the global financial crisis and think of it as an advanced application of all of those foundation principles in macroeconomics that you've been reading about up until now. So included in the global financial crisis, um, you need to understand financial markets, you need to understand the causes of business cycle fluctuations, you'll need to be able to use the aggregate demand, aggregate supply model to illustrate the impact of the global financial crisis on the economy uh, by shifting the aggregate demand curve to the left and you need to be able to talk eventually in the next two topics about policy responses and how those policy responses are aimed at shifting the aggregate demand curve back to the right to reach full employment again and the problems associated with trying to get an economy back to full employment. So this really is an advanced application which will help us bring all of the uh, economic or macroeconomic principles that we've been reading about together. So in terms of the global financial crisis, there's a YouTube clip there for you to to take a look at. But in terms of the, the causes of the global financial crisis, I need you to think about those causes under two banners. First of all, the macroeconomic factors and then the financial market factors. Now going through, I will be going through each of these in a little bit of detail, but the first thing I need to say is that the amount of detail that I'll be going through uh, these factors is not um, adequate for this course. What I mean is that you'll have to do your own reading on each of these factors. So what I'm trying to do in this presentation is provide a high level overview of the key factors that cause the global financial crisis, motivate them a little bit, explain them a little bit, but then leave it up to you to go into detail in terms of uh, uh, your readings go into detail uh, and understand them fully. So in terms of the macroeconomic factors, let's just go through it um, point by point. First of all, global imbalances, that's an incredibly important part of this course and so you really need to be doing some reading about global imbalances and understand what they are. Uh, the causes, not only the definition of global imbalances but the causes of, of them and the consequences of them as well. So uh, global imbalances is one of those big important topics in this course. The second one, loose monetary policy in the United States, you have to do, uh, whereas for global imbalances you have to do a lot of reading, um, with loose monetary policy, uh, not so much reading. I encourage you to do a little bit of reading to understand why interest rates or short-term interest rates were pushed very low in the early 2000s in the United States and how that linked on and helped create the global financial crisis. Um, but just a, a small amount of reading on that so that you understand uh, the role that loose monetary policy played. And then the great moderation, how much reading do you need to do on that? Somewhere between loose monetary policy and global imbalances. So in terms of the great moderation, I'd be thinking you know, a couple of hours of sort of research and reading on the great moderation. So, so that you get to a point where you can write about the great moderation now, in terms of those macroeconomic factors, global imbalances is so important in this course that you may well be asked to write an answer to a question on global imbalances itself. I can't say the same for the, the second two, loose monetary policy and great moderation. If I was expecting you to write about loose monetary policy and the great moderation, it would be in the context of a broader question, such as describe the macroeconomic factors uh, behind the global financial crisis. So hopefully that makes sense. In terms of the financial market factors on the right hand side, I've listed five of the main ones there. Uh, I will be going through and mentioning each of these briefly, but only briefly. It's really going to be up to you to, to do a little bit of reading on each of these five, but only a little bit. You certainly won't get, uh, or you're certainly not expected to know what securitization is in detail. You only need to have a very um, broad understanding of what securitization is and how securitization was used to remove the risk of 
dodgy loans off the balance sheets of banks in the United States in the lead up to the GFC and how that sort of spread the risk associated with mortgage-backed securities and credit defaults, uh, collateralised debt obligations rather, how it spread the risk associated with those assets throughout the world. Uh, you don't, I wouldn't be expecting you to explain in detail or illustrate the securitisation process. And the same can be said for each one of those factors under financial markets. You wouldn't need more than uh, a paragraph of writing on, on each of those, at the very most, if a question related to the financial market factors came up. OK, so let's keep moving. Uh, in terms of the macroeconomic factors, globalisation really has a lot to, uh, or a big role in the creation of the global financial crisis because globalisation means that economies and financial markets are linked more closely around the world than they ever have been before. And it is that linkage that we're going to be bringing out over this, uh, this presentation and trying to understand how money moved between economies and the impact it had on financial markets, etc., etc. So, if you ask uh, most people what the sub, what the global financial crisis was all about, they would talk about things such as U.S. housing, subprime loans, foreclosures, ninja loans, uh, mortgage-backed securities, CDOs, credit default swaps, etc., etc. So they would be talking about the financial market factors. And for most people out there on the street, their understanding of the GFC is limited to financial market factors. Most people out on the street don't appreciate that the macroeconomic factors here are, f are really the main factors uh, in terms of the cause of the GFC. So without those macroeconomic factors, there never would have been a global financial crisis. If we didn't have subprime lending, non-recourse mortgages, etc., etc., even the existence of those macroeconomic factors eventually would have caused some sort of problem somewhere in the US economy. So if the money hadn't have gone, been going into the housing market, for example, it would have found its way somewhere else into perhaps another asset market, and it would eventually have caused problems. So those macroeconomic factors, because they're associated with excess liquidity, very low interest rates, and just an excessive degree of uh, optimism among US households and, and investors, they, to me, are the main causes. Um, and without those, the G not only uh, would the GFC never ex have existed, but we certainly wouldn't be in the situation where we are now, many years after the GFC, still trying to uh, recover from the global financial crisis. And I'm talking from the perspective of the global economy, mainly Europe, the United States, Okay, so hopefully that gives you a feel for how you have to treat these factors. Now, we know that um, there are both macroeconomic factors and financial market factors which we need to understand. But let's go back to basics. Having a look at the housing market here in the United States, it, re it seems that housing prices really took off from the late 1990s, early 2000s, hit a peak just before the global financial crisis hit in 2000, late 2007 going into 2008, and then those housing prices really crashed, and that was really then the onset of the global financial crisis. So the question then becomes, where did this money come from to actually inflate housing prices to the extent that they were inflated in the United States? Well, one possibility, and ho well, before I go on to that, hopefully you can appreciate that an asset market such as real estate cannot experience this type of bubble, this type of price inflation, without a lot of new money entering the housing market. So literally what would have to happen is you would have bought your house for a million dollars, and let's just Let's just imagine you, you've bought a house for a million dollars and you've sold it and you want to move into a new neighbourhood. How would you get prices rising? Well, you'd have to take that million dollars and borrow another 500000 and then bid 1.5 for a similar house in, in another neighbourhood, a similar neighbourhood. So if you take the value of existing housing, add debt to it, and then use that uh, to... to 
to s well that the original value of the house and the debt can be used to actually bid housing prices higher. So what I'm trying to say in a roundabout way is that the only way you can get strong asset price inflation in an asset market is if there is large quantities of new money coming into that market. It's the only way prices can get bid up. If you don't have new money coming into the market, prices will be very, very flat indeed. So where did the money come from? Well, one possibility would be Americans simply saved more money so their marginal propensity to save increased and they poured that money into the housing market. But if we actually look at the data here, that's not the case. What seems to have happened is from around about the mid-1980s, the savings rate in the United States actually declined towards zero. So it's not as if Americans saved more and used those savings and poured those savings into the housing market. In fact, with this decline in the savings rate, it has been attributed to, and I'm talking about the decline from around about the mid-1980s onwards, it has been attributed to the Great Moderation. And I'll explain to you, and you certainly you'll be doing a lot of reading about the, the Great Moderation, so you'll have a better understanding uh, at the end of this topic about what the Great Moderation is all about and how it created, uh, in hindsight, excessive levels of optimism in many economies around the world, particularly the United States. So people, because of the Great Moderation, people in the United States were so confident about the future that they felt there was a reduced need to actually save money. Well, the GFC hit and they real, quickly realised that that was just not the case at all. And savings in the United States has, have ticked up at the household uh, level. They've, they've increased again at the household level. Um, but uh, they're not quite back to 10% the level they were in the 70s and 80s. So we're still asking this question, where did the money come from? Well, the simple answer is it came from overseas, but to understand how it came from overseas and why it came from overseas, to get a fuller picture of this, uh, we need to go back to basics. So where I'm going to leave this particular presentation is, A, we know that the money was not sourced from households themselves, it wasn't as if households started saving more and putting that money into the housing market. And uh, B, we know the money came from overseas. But why did it come into America? How did it come into America? And what impact did it have when it got into the United States? That's the next part of the story.